That's it. That's so it. now I'm recording. Beauty. Beauty. We're all rolling. Excellent. All right. Have a good Thanks one. I'll leave you guys to it. Cheers. Thank you, mate. Thanks, Jeremy, for um for taking the time, obviously. Um how yeah. how are you going? Really well. Really well. Great. Um for the podcast, yeah, we might get you to introduce yourself. Um and so sort of give us your full name, your your title and um a bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, my name's Jeremy Britton. I'm the CFO of Boston Coin. I started in financial planning back in 1992 during the recession that we had to have. And I've, I've got obviously a lot of years of, of experience in financial planning. And um, I, wasn't, I wasn't one of the first people into crypto. I wasn't mining. I wasn't that, wasn't that early. Um, but once it started to be a thing and started to be seen as an investment, um, then I, I got into crypto. And it was a couple of years later when it started to take off really and, and hit the mainstream media, like 2017, that's when the people on the street started to find out about crypto. And because most people knew me, because I'd had 25 years experience in financial planning and I'd written a couple of books and things, people came to me and said, hey, what do you know about crypto? Can you help me to invest in crypto? And in my mm. first book, I'd actually written, there was a nine nine step selection to choosing your own stocks because I didn't want every single man and their dog to come to me as a financial planner. I want a lot of people to do it themselves. And so I'd, I'd been investing in crypto, but I'd actually stripped it down to a four step procedure. Um, so I was actually educating a few, a few of my friends and family on how to actually invest in their own cryptos. And that sort of grew over time until I was doing sort of a weekly zoom call on a Monday night with like 30, 40 people from all around the world. Uh, listening in on how to choose choose their cryptos and we we're comparing cryptos and asking questions and things like that. And in the end, I actually started a not-for-profit organisation educating people. We put all of those videos up and, and made those public and made the, the, the system public. And then actually started a um, like a managed fund, like a mutual fund with cryptocurrency inside of it. Because obviously, you know, back in the olden days, Prior to 1975, it was kind of onerous to get into the stock market. You had people who had a lot of money who could actually call their brokers and, and go and do that sort of thing. But the normal mum and dad investors couldn't get into stocks and shares um, until after 1976 when they actually had the, the mutual fund industry, the managed fund industry. And then people could go into the bank with $10,000 and say, hey, whack that into something for me. And someone could actually manage their $10,000 or their $50,000 similar to how we do with superannuation funds. Now you've got no idea what you're invested into until the end of the month, um, but it's, it's all looked after and diversified for you. And it takes a lot of the hard work out of it. So we've got two systems, basically. One is for people who want to learn how to do it themselves. They can access all that education for free on quillionaire.com. And then we've got the system where we do it for you. And we've got sort of very busy people who are very wealthy people, but you know, lawyers and accountants and things like that who say, look, I don't want to do it myself. I don't have time. And mm -hmm. they just give us a bunch of money and say, hey, you guys go and do it for us. And Jeremy, can you remember the first time that you first got interested in, in Bitcoin? Oh, definitely. Uh, definitely. I had a couple of friends who were, who were sort of more nerdy than me and they'd been talking about it for a while and they'd been transacting in it for a while and they, they had enough Bitcoin mining off their laptops that they could actually you know, send some to each other and things like that. And... Um, a friend of mine was actually was making a documentary about Bitcoin. He said, come along, come along, and we'll, you know, we'll watch this little sort of thing that I put on YouTube. And I knew a couple of the guys, but I, I didn't know most of them. I went, I went along and watched this documentary and went, okay, this is, this is actually interesting. It's not just an investment. It's actually a new type of money. And basically removing the middleman from the, from the banking system and a true peer-to-peer -peer exchange, which is what I guess the internet did for music sharing and file sharing and a whole bunch of other things for better or for worse. And after, after we watched this documentary, some of the guys said, oh, let's go out for a drink. And I said, well, yeah, because I, I hadn't actually chatted to the people while we were watching the, the doco. And we went out to the pub and one of the guys said, oh, who wants to shout me a drink because I didn't bring my wallet? And I said, oh, well, because like I'd never met him, but I wanted to, you know, ingratiate myself amongst this group of friends who knew a lot more than I did. And so I bought him a couple of beers and a couple of beers. For, and this guy says, oh, look, I'll, I'll pay you in Bitcoin. I said, no, no, don't worry about it. Like, we're just friends. We're just meeting. He said, no, no, give me your phone. And he took my phone and he set up a Bitcoin wallet on it. And he transferred in 
in Bitcoin the amount of money that we'd actually spent on beers. And I just thought, oh, it's cute. It's like, you know, under $20, say. And it was just sort of, okay, I've got this little app on my phone and it's just there. And I don't know anybody who has Bitcoin that I can transfer it to. And I didn't know a lot of other people who had Bitcoin that could transfer it to me. So it's like I've got some, I don't know, some Croatian dollars or something like that. They're just sitting there as a bit mm. of curiosity. But obviously, when things started to go ballistic and the Bitcoin price went from $1,000 up to $20,000, all of a sudden, my little beer money suddenly turned into a fortune. And when people started coming to me and saying, how do I do this? How do I set up a wallet and things like that? I'd just email them and say, look, here's a link. I've just sent you $50 worth of Bitcoin. And they could click on the link in the email. That would open a wallet and they'd have some money in there and then they could start buying their own. And so of the, the 20 odd dollars that this bloke had given to me, I think I ended up giving out about $500, $600 to other people. And I still had a lot more left than what I started with. So wow. uh, yeah, it was just interesting meeting a guy in a pub and getting my first Bitcoin. And then you know, for, for many other people, I've become the, the giver of their first Bitcoin. So it started this thing. And obviously there's, there's been a groundswell ever since. And I think we, we really need it. Um, so obviously I've been in finance for a long time and we've got staff internationally and, and things like that. So, you know, 10 years ago when I used to send money to, to our employees in Indonesia or in India or in the Philippines, it would cost, you know, 30, 40, up to $70 to transfer money to them. And, you know, recently, you know, with, with Boston Trading, we actually sent 12,000 US to an accountant and it cost under 60 cents to transfer that money. So it's just amazing. Wow. Um, yeah, not just putting money into Bitcoin because Bitcoin will go up in value as gold goes up in value, but the, the ability to send money really, really quickly and far less, uh, far less expensively than what the banks do. And tell me a bit more about, I guess, what that, that boom in prices around sort of 2017. Um, you know, did you gain a lot of, of money and do you have sort of, did your friends uh, have that experience as well? We do okay. Um, I, I guess it's, it's like when, when the invention of a new technology comes along and most people of a certain age will remember being on MySpace you know, back in 2006, mm. 2007, and MySpace was everywhere. And then Facebook came out of, out of left field and basically buried MySpace. And you know, I, I don't know, like me personally, I don't know whether Bitcoin is going to be the dominant currency in the next 10 or 20 years. I don't know who's going to be the dominant software provider. Like back when we we're all buying Nokia's and Ericsson phones, no one knew that Apple was going to just completely cannibalize those markets. So it's, it's basically, again, what we're doing with Boston Coin is we're diversifying and saying, okay, we're going to choose very well and very safely and then see what happens over the long term. So obviously, you know, we bought Bitcoin, we bought Ethereum, uh, we bought into Chainlink, I think, two years ago, before Chainlink went ballistic. So we, we paid about a dollar, dollar twenty um, for those, and it took a long time. They just sort of hovered along for about twelve months, and then just in the last sort of six months, everyone's going on about DeFi, and now you know the, the things we paid a dollar twenty for are now twenty four dollars. So that's a massive return. And we, we were doing DeFi last September. We started investing with Celsius and earning interest because we're holding for the long term. We're not, we're not sort of day trading and flipping these, these coins around. Um, so we started investing with Celsius and earning interest on the Bitcoins while we were holding them. Even though the price was going up and down, we were making 5 and 6% return. But now Celsius themselves, we've actually made over 900% return on Celsius in the last 12 months. So... It's, and again, I don't know, like the, back before 1913, there was dozens of central banks, there was dozens of local banks mm. and things like that. And over time, like car manufacturers, like phone manufacturers, the bigger ones cannibalize the smaller ones. So if we choose wisely and we hang on for the longer term, then we're going to be mm. okay. And, but back in that initial, you know, when you had that Bitcoin, that first amount of Bitcoin, it must have taken you a bit by surprise that initial, you know, price, price jump. You wouldn't have factored that in. No, no, certainly not. And and I, I confess, that I, got, I didn't investigate so much into it, like what it could possibly do. I guess a lot of people buy a computer or a game console and they're not aware of what it can do. Like my folks are in their 80s. They've got smartphones, but they mostly use them for video calls. 
and they're not aware that it's, you know, that computer is 16,000 okay. times more powerful than the one that landed me on the moon. Um, so with, you know, obviously with the Ethereum network, you can build games on there, you can build collectible artworks, you can do smart contracts for, for real estate and things like that. And as I say, like Bitcoin is, is basically gold that I can email to somebody else. And, you know, you and I remember when we had to pay a dollar for a stamp to send documents mm. to people. Now email is just instant and it's, it's basically free, you know? So it's, it's ama amazing, certainly amazing technology. And you don't know when something comes out, how far it's going to take off. So um, we, we've seen this back with the, the tech stocks, you know, in the, in the late 90s when tech stocks just went ballistic. Um, and a lot of people forget that between 2000 and 2002, that Microsoft dropped by 80%. Apple dropped mm. by 65%. And if you were holding on to those stocks, imagine if you put 100,000 into Microsoft and then you go, oh my God, I wake up the next morning and I've got 12 grand left. Um, yeah. I should probably get out. Or for this to yeah. recover from 12,000 to go back to 100, it's got to go up by 800%. Like, is that even possible? But the people who hung on to the good quality stuff after the tech wreck, of course, Apple and Microsoft bounced back and Dell and these kind of guys bounced back. Mm. A lot of companies disappeared. And that's what we saw in the crypto space 2017, 2018, the big shakeup. 92% of the, um, the coins, the token projects that were around mm. in 2017 turned out to be scams or went bankrupt. And even though we were holding 50 different coins at that time, none of ours disappeared because we'd done the research and we'd invested in good projects. Obviously they went backwards because everything went backwards like it did in the, in the market crash. But those ones have started to bounce back now. And a lot of them have actually gone on as I say, significantly further. Yeah. Were you expecting that sort of crash in terms of were you seeing in the market that there are all these sort of unsustainable projects, all these, all these coins that were effectively scans did you see that coming yeah definitely definitely if you, if you go back through my facebook feed you know from three or four years ago you'll see me warning people like crazy um because it, it was unsustainable to make you know three thousand percent per month mm. every month and after it's gone up ten thousand percent people jumping in thinking it's going to do that again which is just as silly as seeing something on the stock market saying okay this this gold stock has gone up 200 percent in the last six months i better jump in now no, the time to jump in was six months ago. Um, yeah. And after it's gone up 200%, it might drop back down to half. You know, that's possible. Who knows? It might, it might double again, but probably not. And obviously, yeah, when, when Bitcoin was just going straight up and thinking, okay, it went from like $1,000 to $20,000 within a few months, you think that's not sustainable long-term growth. And the amount of, of fees and things that people can make from because being that I'm from a stock background, I'm always looking at what's the income from this, you know, if yeah. during the, the price rush with the houses, when houses went crazy, you think, okay, the houses all doubled in value, but if the rent hasn't gone up, then either the market has got a drop or the market's going to sit flat for about five years until the rent again picks up to the stage where investors can pick up four or 5%. So same with stocks, you know, if, if stocks are selling, like Tesla stock, uh, selling at like 3,000 multiple, and you go, I've, I've got to hold that stock for beyond my grandchildren's lifetime before I actually make my money back in dividends. Yeah. It's not sustainable. So, you know, good, good safe, long-term growth is fine. And if it's, if it's 20% a year, 30% a year, that's fine on average. But obviously the market doesn't work like that. We have these huge boom and bust cycles. Mm. And I've, I've been around for a lot of them. So I've seen it before and it'll see it again. <laughs> the best you can do is Did you have and, for this one? What's that? For this particular um, crash, did you see any horror stories in terms of people losing their houses or, or losing their... I mean, I'm sure people would have lost their businesses if they'd centred their business around some of these coins, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, not, not someone I know personally, but there was an Australian guy who actually sold his house and put his family into a camper van and um, he put all, that, all the house money into Bitcoin. Uh, while, whilst it was accelerating, he said he was just going to travel around Australia with the family and live off the Bitcoin. And of course, Bitcoin famously went from $20,000 down to $3,000. And you go, okay, look, he's, this dude just lost 90% of his money. And that's what he was, he was living on. I did have one of my friends on the Gold Coast who was actually, he put his house on the market and um, 
there was a multi multi million dollar house on the waterfront down the Gold Coast, and instead of asking for five million dollars, he just said he wanted the equivalent amount in Bitcoin, and he wanted to, to stay in the house. He just wanted someone to give him the Bitcoin. He was going to rent it back because he was going to make so much more money from the Bitcoin than he was from his property. So interesting. And what what do you sort of tell people if you know at the time that would have seemed maybe not like a smart idea necessarily but like <laughs> not you know not unbelievable if it keeps going up and you know yeah. i'm going to be savvy and what 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 would your recommendation be in terms of i guess you know making sure that you're not falling victim to those sorts of things well it's it's pretty easy to spot a scam if you've been scammed before or if you know someone who's been scammed before like if someone rings me out of the blue and says hey i've got a hot Top stock tip for you. I don't know who they are. I don't know where they're, where they're calling from. Yeah. You know, some people will fall for that because they haven't been scammed before. Um, or if you get a text message or an email that looks like it's come from the bank, but it actually comes from nabbankaustralia.com.au instead of actually nab.com.au. I've had the same phone number and the same email address for 25 years. So I'm on a lot of dark web databases out there and I get scam, scam things all the time. So, but I, I know what to spot and I teach people how to spot the scams and not lose their money on, on obvious scams. And there was a lot of obvious scams around 2017 and there's still obvious scams around now. Uh, one, of the, one of the hottest coins in the last two months has been um, Yiffy and Yiffy's gone up from $3 to $30,000. But then wow. if you look on, the, on the, the coin market cap or coin gecko, there's a lot of coins that have been given a name that's almost identical to it. Instead of YFI, they're YFV or YFL or something like that. And people have just made these so that they'll look legitimate and they'll just take your money and they'll run. And this, this is why you know, we teach people to look out for scams and we teach them the four-step process, which is C-O-I-N, so it's very easy to remember. And you're just looking at it, check out the C-suite, check out the CEO of the company, the CFO. They're on the website, but are the pictures just Google images? Are they generic? If you look them up on LinkedIn, do they actually say this is a legitimate person who is actually working on this project? Because a lot of them, as I say, it costs a couple of bucks to set up a website. You know, it costs a couple of bucks to, to launch a coin into the marketplace. And you can literally make millions but have nothing behind it. And then O is we look at the offering and say, okay, what are these people doing? Because there was a scam where they were going, to, oh, we're going to put fruit on the blockchain and we're going to do something with fruit delivery. It's like, but how does that help people? You know, the offering of Bitcoin is you've got this digital money that you can email to anyone anywhere in the world for a couple of cents, um, which is obviously good value for people who are paying themselves or their staff or whoever sending money for transactions it's a lot cheaper than sending money through the visa network or through the banking network so looking at is it is it a decent offering is it actually going to help and revolutionize things um you know power ledger send, sending solar power mm. to your friends and family um, rather than sending it through the middleman and them taking their cut that's a great offering you know it's an australian yeah. one which which we love and we've supported that for four years now um, so then I, we look at the investors and say, who are the early investors in that? And are they idiots? So with, with Power Ledger, when we first found out about that was after Richard Branson got involved. And of course, Richard Branson's passionate about solar. He's got solar panels all over Necker Island, but he's also no fool. You know, he's had hundreds of successful businesses. And we say, okay, if Branson's investing into it, we've checked out the C-suite. They're Australian guys living in Perth and they are legitimate real people. And we've checked out the offering. We believe it has value. And we see Branson's in there. And then we go, okay, we check out the end, which is the network, and say, who else is talking about it? Because if there's a coin out there that no one's talking about, no one knows, even if it goes up in value by 20,000%, who are you going to sell it to? You're going to need to have market depth or liquidity, I guess they used to say in the stock market. And who, who's actually talking about this? Who's interested in it? Who can I sell it to? If I want to sell off, half of my portfolio and cash in some of that massive gain that I just made, who can I sell it to? Otherwise, it's just a gain on paper, which can be taken away at a moment's notice. And do you feel like the industry is moving? I mean, you mentioned that there are obviously some still scams going on today. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like the industry is moving closer to a place where, um, you know, it, it is just those pure um, sort of genuine use cases 
and um, a bit like more that blockchain is becoming this, you know, all the, all the bad guys get weeded out basically. And it's only genuine use cases for, for blockchain left. I, th I think it'll take a long time, David. So you, know, you, you sort of watch old movies and you see the snake oil salesman and, and that sort of stuff. Like mm. that was an era that went on for a long, long time because we didn't have the FDA. We didn't have proper medical testing and medical approvals and people could make any claim about any product they liked until a, a standard came in and was able to judge these things and test these things. So I think it's, it's going to be a while. There's, there's still some, some cases going on, like is a coin a security? Is a token a security? You know, is it governed by the Bank Act or by the Stocks Act? Or you know, what is this thing? It's only been around for the last 10 years or so. Um, unlike obviously stocks and shares, which have been around for, for hundreds of years and property, which has been around for hundreds of years. So there, there's still sort of a bit of indecision we, we don't know what this thing is. It's brand new, it's untested. And so far it's, it's not regulated by all the, the countries in the world. So it's still possible to operate scams. And as I said before, there's still scams going on in the stock market, even, even though there is regulation in the stock market. Right. So it, it's going to take a while. I don't think you'll ever eliminate scams because there's always going to be rat bags. Whenever there's a profit to be made, there, there's always going to be someone mm. who'll try and rip you off. Um, but it'll probably get safer. The industry will evolve as the stock market has evolved and, and gotten better over time. And um, I, th I think it's, go it's going to be an exciting space. And, and as I said before, I don't know whether Microsoft is going to be better than Apple in the next 10 years. I don't know whether the iPhone is going to be beaten by the Samsung phone or Huawei or someone who comes mm. out of the left field. We can't predict that. But if you diversify amongst, you know, the top 10 or the, you know, whatever, get into a, a managed fund or a mutual fund where someone's doing the work for you, you're going to be a lot safer than someone who's sold their house and put it all on the one coin. And yeah, just wanted to ask you too, Jeremy, in terms of what you think the potential, you know, realistically is for, for this sector in terms of um, what it can, what it can do um, in the big picture future. Yeah. Well, obviously, you know, the cryptocurrency is just a very, very small sort of microcosm mm. of the greater economy. And, you know, I, I didn't know the, the COVID outbreak was going to happen, but I've been in the market long enough. You know, I, I wrote my first book two years before the, um, the GFC occurred and I was warning people there's going to be a big market crash. It's coming out of the US. The debt levels are unsustainable. The ninja loans and the low doc loans that they were doing back then were just ridiculous. And you can see these patterns emerging. So you know, two years before 9-11 plane crash, I was warning people the market was overheated. Obviously, I didn't know it was going to be a terrorist attack, but there's always a trigger event. And back in September last year, I saw the, um, the overnight repo market in the US went from below 2% to above 8% in a second. I went, okay, there's liquidity problems in the US market. They're still over leveraged. We did all this stimulus back in the 2008 financial crisis but it hasn't really stopped. Like all those bailouts saving those big banks, we sort of went on a big party with free money. But then after an expansion like that, you're supposed to tighten your belt. You're supposed to actually you know, settle down a little bit. But we didn't do that. And, and debt has been climbing. And so September last year, we were actually warning people to get out of the stock market to exit their leverage positions because we're saying there is going to be a crash coming. And we didn't know what was going to trigger it. Obviously, you know, this, this pandemic has affected the whole world, not just the US markets and the Australian mm. markets and the English markets like the GFC did. So, you know, things have gone down. Things are going to take a while to recover because it's a massive drop. But meanwhile, governments around the world are just throwing more money at the problem because they can't lower the interest rates any lower without going into negative interest rates. If they go into negative interest rates, like what they've done in Europe, they cause bank runs and then people want to go and take their money out of the bank and then they're going yeah. to have a bigger liquidity problem. So I'm, I'm sort of watching what's going on in the US right now and in Australia right now. And it reminds me of when I was in Zimbabwe 10 years ago when they just ran the printing presses all the time. And I've still got a drawer full of, of Zimbabwe notes, $100 million notes and $50 trillion notes. So we're going to see hyperinflation. We're going to see money that is worth less and less and less. And that's why back in September last year, we said to our investors, you know, get into gold, get into silver, get into Bitcoin, because those things, they can't make any more of those. They're a scarce commodity 
And when the government starts throwing money around like it's, like it's monopoly money, scarce commodities will go up in value. So of course, we've seen the gold price go up by 50%. Uh, gold mining stocks are up by about 200%. Uh, we invested heavily into silver and into silver mines. So one of our silver mines is up 260%. Um, and it's, it's based on this government's devaluing their own currencies. So anything that's in a finite supply, and, and Bitcoin is included there with the gold and the silver, is going to increase in value. There's some of the coins out there that they can just simply print more if they want to. Ethereum is one of those. I think Ripple is one of those as well, where they can just print more. Um, so that's got their own issues with their own inflation, but there's going to be no inflation of the Bitcoin, the, the Bitcoin itself. It'll just be the price of it going up as we see the value of the dollar going down. Um, and maybe finally, Jeremy, any other sort of predictions for, for this space? It's obviously a really interesting one and it's been interesting for a few years now. What, what do you think is going to happen? Any sort of bold claims you want to make? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to be the, the, I guess, the voice of doom or anything like that. But what, what we say to our, to our clients is, you know, and financial planning and that sort of stuff, they say you're supposed to save 10% of your income. And if you can live on 90% of your income, save 10% of your income, you're going to be okay. You're going to have a happy retirement. But if you save 10% of your income every month, by the end of the year, you've got one month's income set aside. And that's fine. But if you get sick, if you're off work, or if you blow that money, you know, you, you, one bad month is going to throw you out for a year. So two or three bad months is going to throw you out for three years. Now, this pandemic, we've seen it's, it's been extending on for over six months. So anyone who's expecting a V-shaped recovery and everything is going to be fine you know, next week or next month, or even if they bring out a vaccine tomorrow, it's not going to happen. You know, we've, we've had six bad months. It's going to take probably five or six years to recover. Some of the more negative people are saying it's going to take 20 years to recover because the government has printed so much money and given away so much money and accumulated so much debt. They're going to need to bring in, you know, increase taxes and, and increase their own revenue to basically pay themselves back for all the money that they've given away. So we're not expecting a quick V-shaped recovery. We're expecting a, a long recovery. But you know, even during the, the Great Depression, 19, 1929 to 1933, there was more millionaires created in the Great Depression than any other time in history because there were some people who were smart enough to read the writing on the wall, to look at the patterns, to study the economic clock, and to know where to invest it at the right time. Because obviously, as I said, like gold's gone up by 50% in the last six months. But what was it doing for the previous few years before that? Like it sat flat for about five years, you know? So scarce commodities right. will do very, very well during times of crisis. And if you're smart enough, or if you know someone who's smart enough to, to pretty well predict when those crises are going to occur. And as I said, like, I, you know, I predicted in 99 there was going to be a crash. I was, I was two years early with that predicted in 99 that the, the housing market was going to take off because it was seven years since we'd had that super high uh, interest rates when I, was, when I was first in financial planning. And the interest rates dropped from 17% down to 5%. And the housing market had to take a long while to recover. So you know, it's, it's better to be, be a year or two early than to be six months too late because you don't want to be piling into the market at the top of the market. But this is one of those cases where you know, we're not seeing the, the thing that's really all around us because it's like fish can't see the water, birds can't see the air. We can't see that housing prices going up, wages going up, stimulus packages being handed mm. out is simply dollars being devalued. And in, in a sense, you can look at it and say, you know, gold price hasn't really gone up by 50% at all. It's actually just the price of the dollars that we're measuring the gold in has gone down. So, you know, back, back in the day when I was, I was five foot tall and all of a sudden they changed the measuring system and now I'm 175 centimetres, I didn't grow. They just changed the measuring. And the dollars are reducing in value. The more the government gives away the money and the more they print it, it actually reduces the dollar. So this is a time to invest in scarce commodities and then wait and see what happens in five or ten years' time if they do a currency reset like they did in Zimbabwe and what they did in Germany in the Weimar Republic. Have a look at history and you can see the patterns. You pretty well know what's going to happen next. And, um, and just on that, is it, you know, is the message to, to look first at Bitcoin or are you saying look at sort of 
all the, the coins that are around at the moment? I, I would definitely sort of look in the top 100. Um, and again, using that, that coin methodology, the four-step process, and basically sorting out the, the cream from the crap. As I said, you know, the, the, best, the best we did is to say, okay, out of the 50 projects that we, hold, we held through the crash, none of them disappeared. A lot of them went down by 70 or 80%, but none of them disappeared. And now that we're on the other side of the recovery, um, and this month we've had returns of 900%, 1600%. We've had probably five or six coins over 100% because we actually invested in quality and quality will always come back. And that's what happens, you know, again, with the stock market or with the housing market. You know, when there's a mining boom, houses out in the middle of whoop whoop go through the roof in value, but after the mine closes down, they're all going to stop. Whereas houses around the CBD, within five kilometres of the CBD, are always going to hold their value over time despite, despite the market fluctuations. And good companies will be around for, for the longer haul. I mean, in, even in Australia, we've got companies who've been in business for 150 years. They've traded through the depression. They've traded through... World War One and World War Two, and they're going to come outside of the other the other side of the pandemic looking stronger and better. But there are some companies who started up five years ago that will just disappear. They won't be able to help hold their doors open once the stimulus packages stop. Beautiful. Um, anything else, Jeremy, to to add? I feel like we've got everything we need for for the episode. I feel like that's great. Yeah. Well, if anybody wants to have a look at um, the Boston coin and get someone to do it for them, they can go to bostontrading.co. Um, dot co not dot com and if anybody wants to find out how to do it themselves and, and learn a whole bunch of stuff about the crypto space uh, they can go to trillionaire.com and there's a bunch of free content free videos and a lot of free information they can actually click and, and download their first wallet and you know even if they put twenty dollars in and just watch it you don't have to buy an entire bitcoin you know if it's if it's twenty thousand dollars for bitcoin you don't have to buy an entire one like you don't have to buy an entire bar of gold you can just buy five dollars worth or ten dollars worth and you can see how that goes. Obviously, don't put all your all your money into into crypto any more than you would put all your money into the stock market. So just take a little bit, get in there, get some education, and um, yeah, learn it for yourself. It's just it's a new new investment, um, and it's a it's a new area, it's a new technology, and we're learning more all the time. Beautiful. Thanks so much for, for jumping on, Jeremy. Yeah, yeah. much appreciated. And um, yeah, and if you wouldn't mind just sending that, that file over via email as well, um, so I've got your audio, um, yep. that'd be super. Fantastic. Thanks for your time, Dan. Beautiful. Th thanks very much, mate. Have a good Cheers. one. Bye.